Hi there, uh, my name is Matthew Gustile, and this is a talk uh, that introduces procedural content generation, specifically meant for the Game AI class at the University of Alberta. Uh, if you are not in that class, and you're just coming across this video at some point on the internet, uh, welcome. Okay, so uh, for those of you actually in this class, there is going to be a couple questions during this presentation. You're going to need to fill those out for participation credit. You can either follow this form uh, link here, or you can use this tiny URL link. Doesn't really matter to me, uh, though the tiny URL link may have expired by the time you're seeing this. Notably, uh, if it's after noon Wednesday, March 18th, 2020, then uh, those in the class will be able to see the slides. Okay, so procedural content generation. What the heck is that? Well, put simply, it is a way of computationally representing a design process. Uh, there are large time and expertise requirements for doing that, for taking your design knowledge and turning it into something that can be computed. And it is frequently used content, uh, frequently used to create new content rather for a single game. Uh, so over here on the right, you can see a image taken from Hello Games is No Man's Sky, which famously uses PCG all over the place. So it uses PCG to create creatures. All these creatures are procedurally uh, generated. Um, it creates pre-CG land masses, PCG, um, you know, floral stuff, PCG structures, etc., etc., etc. So tons of stuff is generated. Uh, when I say PCG, I'm talking about procedural content generation, to be clear. Okay, <laughs> there it is, procedural content generation PCG. So it's the algorithmic generation of content. Specifically, I'm going to break that into three categories. The first of this, these are game bits. So these are pieces of a game, things that we would think of as being part of a game. So this might be, for example, decoration or um, weapons, or it could be uh, characters in that game. And there's game spaces. So these would be the parts of the game that you traverse, the, the things you go through. So levels for a lot of game, maybe puzzles for other games, uh, or whole worlds for particular games. And then last but not least, game scenarios. So these are things like game stories or their quests, uh, being able to generate out whole new quests that would fall under game scenario. Notably, I've stolen these terms from uh, Procedural Content Generation for Games, a survey. There's paper here. You don't have to read it, but it's worth checking out if you're interested. Uh, I'd also recommend checking out Chapter 4 of Yannickakis and Julius's Artificial Intelligence and Games. You can find the whole thing online, which goes into PCG in a little bit more detail. And uh, last but not least, shout outs to Adil Zafar. Uh, he's a PhD student who I have uh, used a bit of his survey uh, for the, constructing these slides. So uh, let's talk about game bits for a second and talk about a few examples. So in the Borderlands series, if you've ever seen that, and if you haven't, I recommend Googling it. It's an interesting thing. Uh, you can see that every single gun in the game is procedurally generated. Uh, that's actually not fair. There are special story-specific guns that do specific things, but in general, if you just pick up a gun, that gun has been procedurally generated. The way it works is that you have some values, things like damage per second, things like accuracy, things like spread, things like number of shots, and those get randomly tuned based on where you are in the game, uh, the kind of gun company that supposedly made this gun, et cetera, et cetera. There's speed tree right there in the middle. Now speed tree is pretty interesting. It is a tool for producing trees to match a particular aesthetic. If you've played a game recently, and you've seen trees, and they haven't all been the same, chances are pretty high that you're seeing the output of speed tree. It's a really nice way for designers to make a whole bunch of stuff that nobody particularly cares about. And of course, we already talked about No Man's Sky. So then we have game spaces. So here's some examples. Uh, there's Rogue 1980. Um, it's often cited as the first example of using PCG in games, uh, and it's where the term roguelike comes from. The way that it worked right was that it generated out these sort of little mazy dungeons with individual rooms, uh, and then you had to sort of go through different layers of these dungeons to make it to the bottom floor and back up again. 
Um, and it was randomly generated every time. Uh, you'd have to start from scratch every time. Now, notably, it isn't actually the first example of PCG in games, but it's close enough. It doesn't particularly matter. Then you have things like the more recent Remnant from the Ashes from last year, which tied together chunks of pre-authored content together to create sort of variations on possible worlds you could be wandering through. Spelunky, the bottom left there. Uh, Spelunky 2 is coming out soon, uh, if, you're, if you're, well, soon as of me recording this. Um, Spelunky, notably, uh, again, is sort of a roguelike in terms of every time you die, you have to start over from scratch, and it's a whole new world every time. But uh, it's notably in this sort of 2D sort of platforming style perspective. And then, of course, there's Minecraft, which I don't think needs an introduction. But, of course, all the worlds of Minecraft are generated, uh, where there are particular ranges that particular biomes, particular sort of types of environments can have. And then those are randomly sampled to figure out what the actual geography is going to look like. Then we have game scenarios. Now, for this one, I have to look a little bit harder as uh, this is the least common application of PCG in games right now. So in Skyrim, if you remember Skyrim, I mean, it's been released on every single console, so I wouldn't know, I uh, wouldn't be able to think why you wouldn't remember Skyrim, but uh, Skyrim actually had radiant quests, which would do things like, say, go to particular location X, kill particular thing Y, X or seven times or Z times or whatever you'd like. Um, as you can tell from the way that I've said that, they weren't all that interesting, really. Um, they tended to be pretty formulaic, uh, didn't really have anything interesting happening in terms of stories or anything like that. Dwarf Fortress uh, is rather famous for generating its whole world, including like histories and religions, uh, and therefore it also is producing stories. Elsinore is a fairly recent game uh, in which you play as, um, uh, oh, I'm blanking on her name, Hamlet Ophelia? Yeah. Uh, you play as the, the sort of leading lady in Hamlet, and you basically have sort of time travel-y powers where you can go back in time and mess around with things. And that basically means that the story from where you are ends up being generated um, to sort of fit certain constraints. It's actually using planning, which is an approach that we've talked about in this class before. And then we have Caves of Cud, uh, which is a little bit more recent than Dwarf Fortress, but is definitely in that same vein, similar kind of game. A whole world is generated, notably whole histories are generated, including what do people think of those histories. Okay, so if you don't get anything else from this original intro talk, I want you to understand that PCG isn't magic. Uh, some people will say that PCG is magic, and I think that's a little irresponsible of them. Imagine, to get a sense of how you'd actually do PCG, imagine trying to write down instructions so someone you will never meet can create a level, puzzle, creature, etc. for your video game. That's tough, right? Uh, if you are a designer, you probably don't even fully, you can't even fully put your process into words. Imagine having to represent it computationally right? Because this person you're ever going to meet isn't even a person. You can't even say, oh, you know, I want it to be, you know, like this other thing that maybe a person would know. Like, you know, uh, I want this thing to look like a dog, for example. If you're a computer, you have no idea what that would mean. So it's a very tough thing. Another way that you can think about PCG is if you've ever played a deck building game like Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone or any of these, really, uh, you've been doing PCG. Any deck in one of these games is a generator, right? And it generates out possible, uh, you know, hands that you can get, possible sequences of cards that you could get. And anybody who's played a deck building game knows that uh, often you find that a deck that you thought would be really good has some weaknesses. Speaking of that, let's think of a particular case study here. So, Many people might be aware of Mass Effect Andromeda. It was the follow-up to the famous Mass Effect trilogy, and it notably bombed. Uh, it did very, very poorly, at least relative to EA's expectations. Now, what happened here? So, um, Mass Effect Andromeda was in development for five years, but the majority of the development occurred in the final 18 months. Uh, this is all public information. You can read this Kotaku uh, link there at the bottom. The culprit here was PCG. Uh, they basically tried for three and a half years to procedurally generate out a galaxy, to have every time you played 
Mass Effect maybe, this Mass Effect Andromeda, or, you know, everybody would have, like, just a massive generative galaxy. They basically tried to do the No Man's Sky, but for Mass Effect Andromeda. And it didn't work for their style of doing development. Uh, it took way too much effort. There wasn't buy-in. People just uh, couldn't get it to, to happen. Compare that to Splunky. So Splunky was developed in large part by a single person, Derek Yu, and it uses constructive grammar of hand-authored chunks. And the PCG basically makes for a larger game than a single developer could create. Uh, notably, by using this constructive grammar with hand-authored chunks and by being a bit clever, uh, Derek was able to create a game where even though the levels are generated at runtime every single time, uh, critics and players have often said that they feel hand-authored. They, they feel like there's intentionality to the design. Uh, which is not something that the Mass Effect Andromeda people could get working. So, you know, what's the difference? Um, notably, uh, if you're interested, there's a really good book on Spelunky by Derek Yu. Uh, I recommend it. So, first question. Uh, for those of you in the class, go ahead, go back to that Google form and fill in the first question, which is, when do you think it's appropriate to employ PCG in a game? I'll give you a few minutes while I'll sort of pause on the screen. Uh, if you're watching this later, feel free to just click ahead to when I actually get off the screen. All right, see you in a minute. Okay, that seems like enough time. Uh, here's my answer. So <laughs> the only thing I can say with confidence is definitely not always. Uh, it is not always the case that you can apply PCG to a game to make it better. Uh, there was a bit of a um, rumor going around in the games industry, say about five, 10 years ago, that PCG just always added replayability to a game and that it was always a time saver. Um, that's not really true. Uh, now, notably, when there's an existing tool, like something like Speedtree, that you can just plug and play with, I think totally, like throw PCG into that. Otherwise, what I really think, break that down, is when you were trying to create a game that would not otherwise be possible with PCG. Uh, so with Mass Effect Andromeda, part of the problem there was that they were trying to make a standard Mass Effect game, which could obviously be, ma be made without PCG. Three of them were made without PCG. Um, so they were trying to make a game that it was totally possible to make without PCG, and they ran into all sorts of hurdles. But if you're trying to make a game like Splunky or anything else where it needs to be different every single time, it needs to, you know, uh, have this experience of, of exploration, of finding entirely new things constantly, PCG might make sense. But even then, you should be aware of how much time it will take. PCG does not save time in developing a game. It just shifts where that time is spent. So instead of 
spending time iterating on content. Instead, you are iterating on a generator. Now, this ends up taking more time because you have to come up with a generator, generate a whole bunch of content to see how it's doing, think, oh, maybe I need to make this change to fix the output content, go back to the generator, make the change, generate a whole bunch more content, see if it actually fixed it or not, go back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it can take a very long time. Okay, so with that, let's talk about the three major categories or categories of methods that you can find for PCG approaches. The first of these are constructive methods. So these are methods that build up content piece by piece according to particular rules, where the pieces are either hand-authored or generated. Um, so a common thing here is you can think of it as like um, Lego blocks, right? Any sort of building blocks, that's a constructive method. We're gonna build each thing piece by piece. Once a piece is there, it doesn't get changed again. It's just there, we just go forward. The second of these are uh, search-based methods. The idea here is that we instead of just building a thing from start to finish, we define a search space where every point in the space is a usable piece of content. And then we optimize this space, so we try to find a point in the space that is the best according to some hand-authored heuristics and operators. So the operators let us like wander around this whole space. Let's imagine that this screen is our space, big 2D space. Every pixel of this screen would be a unique thing. Maybe it's a level, maybe it's a chair, maybe it's a creature. But regardless, we would start in some position and then we'd look around that space with our operators, start moving around the space with our operators and try to find the best possible thing according to some hand-authored heuristics, some way of a human saying, this is a good thing versus this is a bad thing. Quantifying goodness for our particular content. Then we have machine learning based methods. The idea here is that we wanna train on existing data and try to produce novel data, novel output, novel content, whatever it is, that is similar but not identical to the original data. Notably, I'm not gonna talk about this today. Um, if you're interested, uh, I'll be talking about this in a couple weeks, I would think. Okay, so first off, constructive methods. Uh, there's Basic, the basic rundown is that we can think of all constructive methods as uh, building a grammar, requiring building a grammar. Now, the original concept of a grammar comes from linguistics. You may have heard of it. You might have heard of it in like grade school, for example. Um, but a grammar is generally composed of two parts. There are tokens. These are the basic building blocks of the grammar. In language, these are gonna be like words or phrases. We have particular slots for like a sentence, and we fill those with particular tokens. And the way that we fill those things with tokens is according to some rules. So how these tokens are allowed to be put together, right? So in a sentence, I can't just string like six verbs in a row, right? There are rules that tell us how we can string particular tokens together. So there's three sort of noteworthy methods when it comes to constructive PCG. Um, we'll go into more detail on this uh, on Monday, uh, but for now, I'm gonna do sort of a high level talking about these approaches. First is cellular automata. So uh, in the early days of PCG, this was very popular. Uh, Rogue was sort of based on a, a sort of cellular automata-y thing. Uh, it's really good for making sort of dungeons or caves, things like that. Then we have generative grammars. Uh, now this is by far the most popular current method. If you see a video game that has PCG in it, 95% of the time, maybe even 99% of the time, we're talking about a generative grammar being used. And then we have constraint satisfaction problems. Uh, this is niche, but it's becoming less so. Um, the reason for that isn't gonna come up until next week uh, when we talk about wave function collapse. But for now, uh, let's talk about cellular automata. So it was originally introduced by Stanislaw Ulam and John von Neumann back in the 1940, and uh, Conway's Game of Life made it famous in 1970s. Uh, there's an example here for terrain, but I'm not gonna link it because that feels a little weird. Uh, but I'll sit on this slide for hopefully long enough that you can see it, or you could just you know, hit pause and type this in. Now at each position, at each index, we're gonna make some decision based on rules of, of what thing should go there. Local decisions then are gonna percolate through the content until some, some hand-defined stopping point. So we're gonna iterate every single iteration, we're gonna go through every single position, and we're gonna say, according to the rules, what should be here? And then we keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep iterating, keep iterating, keep iterating until we've hit some hand-defined stopping point or the rules aren't acting anymore. Um, this tends to make really nice little cave or dungeon looking things. Here's a, an example I threw together in Unity really, really quick of uh, making a sort of nice cave-ish looking thing. Uh, it's pretty nice, I think at least. Okay, so then we have generative grammars. The basic idea of a generative grammar is that, uh, well, it's well-suited, first of all, to small stories, levels, creatures, etc. Um, 
Uh, there's a whole Game Maker's Toolkit video I really recommend, which talks about how Spelunky makes its own levels. Uh, I mean, where again, we're not going to watch it here, but I really recommend stopping and watching it, um, especially if you're in my class. Hint, hint. The basic idea here is that it's the sort of basic building blocks uh, that are then strung together. So we have, for example, in this generated creature, this is clearly a head, which is distinct from the, the torso, which is distinct from the front limbs, which is which are distinct from the back limbs, which are distinct from the tail. So we have these sort of one, two, three, four, five pieces, and we're going to stick them together according to certain rules. So for example, a head has to be at this particular location on the torso. The arms or front limbs have to be at this particular location on this torso. The back limbs have to be in this particular location on this torso, and the tail has to be at this particular location on this torso. Now, typically, a generative grammar is built in a single shot with no backtracking or altering after something is generated. So we just generate. And if something's bad, we can always just throw it out. Or maybe we make some changes down the line. Um, but in general, though, that makes generative grammars very, very fast, which makes them good for something like a runtime generation, like in Splunky, where we need to generate whole levels at runtime. Though notably, again, it is time consuming to create, and it takes PCG design expertise to get it right. So you need to actually hand author pieces. So like this doesn't work, right? This creature wouldn't work. Well, I don't know if this creature works right now, but this creature wouldn't work unless somebody had taken the time to actually hand author all these different chunks ahead of time. And it takes PCG expertise to get right because the rules could be slightly wrong, right? So this thing's sort of standing on its hind legs, but maybe we always assumed that these legs, and it kind of looks like maybe this is the case, these legs would only be used for something that was a quadruped, which walked around on four legs. And at that point, maybe we say, oh, wait, uh, we have a rule somewhere in our approach which is wrong and has led to this thing. But just making that one change could lead to a whole change of possible output that we don't like. So it takes time. So to give you a sense of how quickly uh, we can mess around, oh, let me stop that, uh, how quickly we can mess around with generative grammars, I'm going to do a quick Unity example. So here's a very simple Unity scene. Uh, there's nothing in it, it's just a main camera and a directional light. It's a very basic 3D Unity scene. Let's get a cube in there. Now, notably, this is just a cube. Um, I know that I had to like bring it in from here on the side, just not the typical way. Um, that's for just one particular reason, which is that it's using a particular material that I wanted. Um, but otherwise, this is just a basic Unity cube, it's just a basic 3D object, right? So I can go ahead and let's show this off, a very simple version of a constructive grammar by just changing the color of this cube. And for that, I've got this script here called pick a random color. So uh, right now we have this colors to choose from array and it's empty, so let's change that. So we have two colors. Uh, let's have one of these be, I don't know, a bright red, for example. And we'll have another one of these be a uh, blue, for example. Okay, so if I hit play, it's blue. And I hit play, and it's blue, and I hit play. That's what you get for random, and it's red. So what's happening here, right? Let's take a look at this pick a random color script and see if we can figure it out. Okay, so loading this up, loading this up, loading this up. So all that's happening is we are picking a random index for this colors to choose from, and we're just assigning it to this, this material, to this, this color, to the color of this material, rather. So this is really straightforward, right? Uh, we have a slot, the color, and we have some tokens that we've hand-authored, the colors here. I've hand-authored these tokens. Now I've had to pick them from a color wheel, but this is still a kind of hand-authoring. And we can fill this with as many tokens as we like, maybe a gray, uh, and occasionally we'll see that pop up in our output, maybe, if you play along. There we go, there's a gray cube. Okay, so that's maybe not all that interesting. All right, so what can we do to make this a little bit more interesting? Uh, we could, for example, grab a sphere, all right? Uh, here we go, now we have two things. And we could take our sphere and maybe we can do something like, uh, I don't know, uh, put a different set of colors on that. All right, so let's do this pick a random color thing again. Let's go ahead and go with two colors. Let's make one of these colors say a yellow. That seems nice. And let's make another one of these colors be an orange. All right. Oh, 
has no alpha. Let's change that. Okay. So now I can hit play. And okay. So now that we have two sort of slots uh, and uh, three things that can be in one slot, two things that can be in another, we have a lot more combinations here, right? Uh, are we going to have a, a cube, a red cube, and an orange circle? Are we going to have, oh, I don't know, a blue cube and a yellow sphere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, okay, there's more examples here, but uh, it's not clear yet that these are like really all that interesting, right? We're not building structure here. There's no rules. There's just sort of pick something, pick one of the possible tokens and put it into the slot. So there's no rules yet. So let's see if we can change things around a little. So let's go ahead and use this statue builder script. So what we can do is we can throw down for these statue components array, we can put the cube, we can put our sphere. Um, if we hit play, we'll produce a sort of statue of uh, five objects. That's what that says here. Five is the size of the statue. And if we take a look at this script, we can see that all it does is it iterates through the number of uh, pieces we have, the size of the statue, which is five. And at every position, it's just going to pick one of these components. Okay, well, we've added sort of five more possible slots uh, and these two tokens that can fill them, which themselves have one slot each and three and then two things in terms of the color. So we sort of added hierarchy, but there's still not structure here, right? Well, to add structure, what we can do is add some rules. So maybe we want, we want to do something like, say, we only want to, uh, after we have a cube, we then immediately have to have a sphere. And otherwise, we can choose at random. So uh, I'm going to create an int uh, variable called prev id. And I'm just going to use that to track which of the objects we last instantiated. So uh, the zero in this case is the cube, because I put it in the zeroth slot of our array. And the one means a sphere, because I put it in the first slot. So then we need a big if rule. And if prev id equals one, so the last time it was a sphere, then we want to do something different than this random choice. In this case, what we want to do is we always want to, or rather, sorry, <laughs> if, it's, if it's a cube last time, then we always want to make it a sphere the next time. So we're going to add structure. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and hit play, and voila! So anytime we have a cube, we're next going to see a sphere. Let's do this again, just to show that that's the case. We're never going to have two cubes in a row. There we go. Okay, so all right, that, that's starting to seem more like maybe uh, something we'd actually want to see. It looks a little bit more like a statue. Now maybe this looks like a snake with a color. Um, but let's make another change. So maybe we do something where we say um, we actually want to go from int i uh, start start this 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 thing iterating at the first index. So at our first very first um, index, our very first time doing this, we always want to have a cube as our base. Okay, so this is going to have a cube as our base, and then it's going to continue using this rule that we've set up, and then random chance if the rule doesn't fire. So let's hit play. Okay, so a cube is a base, some spheres, another cube, cube is a base, some spheres, a cube, a sphere, cube is a base, four spheres. Okay, so we've created structure, right? which has this effect of sort of limiting the possible output. But it's getting this, this sort of possible space of output closer to what we want. Now I could generate a whole bunch more stuff, more tokens to put in these slots, right? We could have, instead of spheres and cubes, I could have a rectangular prism, or I could have a triangular prism. I could have all kinds of different stuff. But for now, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, I think hopefully you've gotten a sense of how... You can sort of work with rules to constrain the output of a particular grammar.
Okay, so uh, that was the indie example. Hopefully you have a little bit of a better sense of how grammars work. Okay, so uh, the last of the, um, the constructive PCG approaches is a constraint satisfaction problem, also called CSPs. Uh, here's an example of a game that uses CSPs. Uh, it's out of the University of Washington. It's called Refraction 2. It's sort of an education game. Uh, now, notably, uh, these approaches are really well suited for puzzle games or where precision is key. The basic idea is that we have a dense collection of rules, right? Uh, we have a lot of stuff going, a lot of rules in this grammar and where each slot stores every possible solution, so every possible token, until there's only one possible solution, only one possible token that could go in that slot based on our rules. So that's a little abstract, so let's look at an example. So here's my nice constraint satisfaction problem example. Here are our tokens. We have a, a mushroom, a sky, a dirt, and a flower. Uh, those are our four tokens, uh, thankfully provided by uh, um, free for reuse clip art on Google. Then we have these rules. So what these mean are uh, dirt cannot be above the sky, dirt must be below a mushroom, dirt must be below a flower, uh, dirt cannot be above a flower, and a flower must have either another flower or the sky to the right of it. Okay, so to start with, step zero, we have every possible token stored at every possible position uh, for, for all of our slots. So let's say this four by four is our world. Each one of these little cells is a slot. So we have every possible token stored there initially. The first thing we want to do is make some decision. So we're going to collapse down one of these slots to just one thing. Now, typically we'd look at the slot, the particular cell that has the fewest possible tokens that it could, could possibly have there left, but all of them are equal. So we'll just choose one at random and I'm going to choose this one. So I'm going to change this cell right here into a flower. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to sort of percolate the implications of those decisions. So I've done one here automatically, just to give you a sense of it. And why I have done this, why I've put the sky above a flower, is because we know that the ground cannot be above a flower, and that the mushroom must have ground below it, so a mushroom couldn't have been there, and ground couldn't be there, and a flower couldn't be there, because a flower needs ground below it, so that means that sky must have been there. But we actually look ahead at sort of percolating the implications of a particular decision throughout the whole thing. So let's go ahead and do that. So I've made a few more changes here. Uh, now, notably, I changed the cell directly below the flower into ground because of this rule here. It had to be the case that that happened. And below the ground, now ground can only have either a mushroom or ground below it because we know it can't have sky or flower below it. Over here on the right, I've changed the right cell to the flower to either have to be a flower or the sky because of this rule. Okay, so next step, we make another decision. So we either pick this part, uh, this cell here, or this cell here, as they both have an equal number of tokens that they could possibly have in them. Uh, and again, we always wanna go for the minimum number. So in this case, I chose this particular uh, cell and I chose that it has a mushroom in it. So we have the sky, we have a flower, we have the ground, and underneath the ground, we have a mushroom. Seems okay so far. So let's look at implications of that. Well, there aren't any. <laughs> if you'll note, the only implication having to do with mushrooms is that mushrooms must have the ground below them. That can't have anything below it. Uh, now, notably, depending on your implementation, this could either be illegal, because I've said that a mushroom has to have the ground below it, or we could say that if it's the edge of the level, then you know it could have possibly anything in it, right? Because before we do anything, any cell can have anything in it. Okay, so let's move on to step three. For step three, I'm gonna auto head, automatically go ahead and make the decision that this cell to the right of the flower is now the sky. Now, notably, it could have been either a flower or the sky, so this decision was made at random. Then we look at implications of that. So few of them, right? We know that we can't have the ground above the sky, so that's a no-no. And we know that we have to have flowers um, uh, beneath the the, Oh, I've made a mistake here. This is why we have computers do this, uh, right? So we can't have flowers here because flowers have to be above the ground and we can't have a mushroom here either because mushrooms have to be above the ground. So that actually should be a sky as well. Um, so let's look at a final state, uh, a final valid state here. So here'd be an example, right? So option one, we have three flowers in a row. We have the sky, we have the ground, we have a little mushroom below the ground. This looks good, right? Uh, we followed all these rules, <laughs> I even got it right, we couldn't have a mushroom here. We followed all these rules, 
and it looks fine. It looks like a reasonable scene. Uh, now, ignoring the fact that I've used clip art here, right? <laughs> Pretend this looked nicer. But these same rules could lead to this. Now, what's going on here is we have sort of sky on this side. We have a flower at the top of the screen, a mushroom right next to the flower. There's no rule that that can't be happening. We have sort of a layered here of like a mushroom sandwich with dirt around it. And again, we have that same basic column we'd already set up. Now, maybe you can say this is like a cliff side and this would look fine, but it's quite possible this isn't what you had in mind when I showed you these rules, right? And when I showed you these tokens. And that would mean that we need to go back and change these rules to make sure that uh, they can't lead to output that we don't agree with. So we, a simple one, right, would say something like, um, we can't possibly have a mushroom next to a flower, maybe. Uh, that could have potentially fixed this. We, maybe we'd have a sky here or a flower here, which might have looked a little better. Okay, regardless, let's jump on. So the other major method uh, that we're gonna talk about today are search-based methods. So the basic idea here, here is that we wanna define some space S. Again, maybe we can think of this screen as a space, any sort of, anything as a space, right? If it's more than, more than one dimension, where every element E in that space is a valid piece of content, right? So every point of the space is a complete piece of content. We're not constructing a piece of content piece by piece anymore. Every single thing that we're looking at is a whole piece of content. What we're then gonna do is then plug a standard AI search method to find particular content according to a heuristic or fitness function. Now a fitness uh, for a particular E, uh, fitness is gonna take in some element of our space and it's gonna tell us uh, some quantification of the quality of that content, right? So it's gonna give us a number that says how good is this content. And we're gonna use that to figure out like, oh, okay, well, if the number here was low, but the number next to it is higher, let's go over there. Now, search-based me search methods, rather, are generally not used in industry or indie game development. We'll talk about why in just a sec. So uh, the one that's the most commonly used are uh, genetic algorithms. This is a, a method which is based on sort of Darwin's theory of evolution. It's shown up in a few games, mostly that have had academics involved. So Darwin's Demons, which is a game where the enemies sort of evolve as you play to sort of adapt to you. And Petals, which is a game that sort of uh, models the way that, that flowers sort of change across generations. It is by far the most popular search-based method, uh, but again, search-based methods are not particularly pop popular themselves. Um, it is based, again, on Darwin's theory of evolution really loosely. And notably, we're going to go more on detail on this particular approach on Friday and on search-based approaches generally. Okay, so that brings us to question two. What makes a good measure of quality for game content? So in other words, what makes a good fitness function? All right, take a few minutes. Think about this. Again, if you are watching this later on, feel free to jump ahead.
Okay, that seems like enough time. Uh, so here's my answer. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I've worked with PCG for years, and I still don't have a good sense of what is a good general uh, uh, fitness function. Now, this is a little unfair. I do have some ideas. But the reason why I say this is really to just hammer home the point that coming up with a good fitness function is really tough. You might be able to do it for a particular game, but coming up with one that's general is really hard. You might say something like challenge, but to be able to figure that out, we'd have to run like an AI agent of some sort through a uh, particular level, for example, that we were trying to generate. And then we might try to do something like, oh, you want challenging levels? We'll create the most challenging level possible, but that's hardly gonna be a good level, right? Maybe we do something like, oh, we wanna do fun. Okay, well, how do you quantify fun, right? It's a very difficult question. So there's some issues with search-based methods. Uh, it's really hard to determine a good measure of game content quality. They're also potentially very slow. Unlike a constructive method where we're just gonna build until we're done and then we're stopping, we're going to iterate over lots and lots and lots of possible pieces of content. It's much more difficult to control than constructive methods, right? Where we can just swap out our tokens or our rules directly to sort of have a massive impact on the search space or the, the space of possible outputs rather. It's not a search space in that case. And again, more on this on Friday. Now, notably, there's a whole bunch more out there. Uh, again, chapter four of Yannick Akis and Julius's Artificial Intelligence and Games book is quite good. There's the AI and Games YouTube account, which I also highly recommend. And there's a lot of conferences uh, that cover this kind of work. And with that, uh, I will talk to you more on Friday.